Warning. You've reached On The Box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, boy, it's raining. You hear that rain? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny that you say that because I was speaking at a conference uh -huh. not too long ago, and every time I would make a point, the sound guy in the very back of the room would turn on an applause meter. Oh, you and I was all, this is not really happening. <laughs> is it really that bad that he has to turn on an applause meter? And then I, I mean, every major point that I made, and then I come to realize it wasn't an applause meter. It was rain hitting oh, the roof. That's oh, that's funny. But it, the timing was just amazing that uh, God had set up for it. That's nothing. I walked on the moon. <laughs> I, I was speaking somewhere, I think it was San Diego, many years ago, and the sound guy was trying to get my voice to sound a bit like an echo he heard in the Grand Canyon through the whole sermon. <laughs> he just wrecked everything. He's going up and down, and I was going to throw the microphone away after a while. But yeah, sound men can either make or break a sermon. And you don't realize that he exists until... Because something goes wrong. And everybody looks back at yeah, him, giving that snarl. But you may be wondering why we are giddy with excitement. It's because Easy is not here. <laughs> no, okay, that is not necessarily the case. That's We're right. excited because in about three weeks' time, even less, you have the ability to watch Evolution versus God. This is the biggest, I think, project we have come across. Now, you're not being sarcastic. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It is amazing. Not As 180 was a game changer when it came to abortion, yes. yeah. this is the game changer when it comes to evolution that is being taught inside the universities and secular schools. Yeah, I, I feel I'm, Mark and I are shaking our heads at what we've had dropped into our laps again because we didn't plan this. Like We didn't we plan did. 180. Yeah. And Eddie didn't plan it. And, uh, and we're very excited. We really feel God is behind this. Well, you know, with 180, it wasn't always entitled 180. It was entitled Hitler's religion. And then we realized as we took a step back what we had, and it was far exceedingly above all that we could think or yes. imagine. And this video, we thought it was going to be entitled Famous Atheists. Yeah. We took a step back. Because we realized there's no famous atheists. There's no famous <laughs> atheists. Yes. And we had it way more than what we thought that we had on our hands. We put it together, and we were... Just amazed. amazed. And amazed. the trailer is available online on YouTube. You can catch it there if you don't catch it right here. We want to show you the trailer that we've just put together this past week on evolution versus God. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Richard Dawkins. Imagine visiting some of the world's most prestigious universities interviewing top evolutionary scientists, atheists, and holding their feet to the fire until it's clear that there is no evidence for Darwinian evolution, that it's not scientific. So we have thousands of examples. Give me, can you give me one? I can give you, I can give you thousands, just one. one. To summarize, the observable evidence that you give me for Darwinian evolution is bacteria becoming bacteria. Still bacteria, there's no change of kinds. Evolution versus God. If you believe in evolution, prepare to have your faith shaken. You know, the, the problem with those who are unable to see evolution, I think, is they don't have imaginations. That is so true. <laughs> it's raining again. Hey, uh, it was so well produced. Thank you for creating that, Mark. Yeah. You've got a real gift in there. I really enjoyed it. And one thing that I've really enjoyed is uh, when I went to see the professor at USC, his name was Peter. Peter. No, it was Craig. Sorry, Craig. Peter was the other guy at USCLA. Um, you noticed that our version of Origin of Species yes. was in his library right behind his head. I didn't notice it. Yes, when I was it down. was. I'm probably glad I didn't notice it. I would have pointed it out and wrecked the interview, squirrel. But um, what an irony that in this uh, evolutionary biologist's library, right behind where he's been interviewed, was the copy of Origin of Species that we produced. Wow, and that's a nice segue into today's topic, video games. Do they make you smarter? <laughs> that is...
stupid. Do they make you smarter? Well, you know, here's the thing. I read on USA Today recently an article about how we need to allow our kids to play video games. Mm -hmm. And it goes on giving a whole detailed list of reasonings why we need to allow our kids to play video games. And I want to throw a couple out there. This isn't from USA Today. This is from a different article I read today. But uh, it, it raises an interesting point. We want to discuss uh, this as a topic today. Uh, it gives you the ability to solve complex questions. It gives you vocational training. You learn teamwork. And it promotes exercise. I would imagine that maybe that's through We Sport. Or oh, maybe your the thumbs? Wii. Yes. Yeah. We Sport. And I'm not bitter at Liz Ebert for winning the Wii at last year's <coughs> Christmas party that we had. She My won. kids were wanting to have that. But here, here's our first question. It comes from Simon, and he says, hey, I've always enjoyed video games, and I wondered what your thoughts are on the issue. And I'm, I'm just going to throw a couple of topics out there concerning this specifically. Can video games affect how we think? Oh, I think so. Yes. Um, <laughs> guard your heart with all diligence for out yes. of the issues of life. And if you want to see how entertainment affects how we think, just study how much it costs to produce or to get a, uh, an advertisement on the Super Bowl. It costs $3 million for right. one minute or even 30 seconds sometimes because they know that people are influenced by what they see and hear. And that's why you get so much advertising because people are influenced by music, they're influenced by sight. And when you get a video game, and by the way, I play a video game every night. It's called Solitaire. Very powerful. <laughs> very challenging, very exercising, and uh, I love it. Every night without fail before I go to sleep, I play Solitaire, which I enjoy. But there are video games out there that are just crazy. Uh, when computers started years ago, you'd beep, 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 right. and you hit these little yeah. things. That was a lot of fun. Pump. But now you blow the heads off human beings, and you get points for doing it with yeah. sophisticated weapons and, weapons, and blood gushes out, and people get decapitated and hands ripped off, and just horrible stuff, filling your hearts well, uh, uh, this generation's hearts. Right, now, here, here's the thing. You raise a very interesting point. Would you say that this is spilled over into the high school shootings and elementary school shootings that we see today? It's a hard thing to prove, but, yeah, the, the odds are, yes, that uh, this generation is desensitized to violence. Yeah. You know, you think what happened in, in Columbine. Uh, those kids that killed those other kids just love doing it. They mm. enjoy doing it. You look at the transcripts of the trial. It's actually horrific, mm. you know? Brad Snow is with us today, given his expert opinion as our web designer, webmaster extraordinaire, but I also know that he enjoys games. Brad, what are your thoughts concerning this topic? Well, it's been a long time since I really engaged in some real sophisticated gaming. Like but Pac-Man? Uh, yeah, well, That's yeah, I, yeah, that was my favorite. It was the uh, classics, you know, Pac-Man, Burger Time, Qbert. You know, you don't really get to see those anymore, but uh, what is that? String Anyway, <laughs> yeah, and I grew up with the home game system, you know, but it was all like sports related and very simple graphics, you know, nothing that uh, I think would alarm any families uh, or give any moral uh, issues. But nowadays, you really do have to pay attention to the kind of games. In fact, uh, they have rating systems for games nowadays, yeah. not unlike our movies. And by, you know, we make our decisions on what kind of movies we go see based on the rating because we, we're concerned about the content. And I think we have the same concern with video games. And that we, you know, the rating systems will often tell us what it contains and what we should be concerned about our kids seeing, what even ourselves are seeing. And we, in the games that we play in our house, usually are more uh, family activity based ones, yeah. nothing that involves any blood or violence. And um, you know, just so you know, I'm not leaving anybody out. I know several people who do uh, do involve themselves in gaming quite a bit, and they've actually used that as an avenue for ministry. Uh, where they, cause there are definitely communities involved in gaming, and they have uh, injected themselves into those communities and uh, been able to relate the gospel to the people who are involved in gaming just as they are. In fact, a couple of those guys uh, came to a, a couple of our academies right. uh, in the past. Yeah, Virgil and Ben. Right. They're amazing guys. They're always playing video games. They're always using that as a platform mm. to share the gospel. <clears throat> uh, there's a specific console that I'm aware of, the Xbox and I think it's the Xbox 360. Is yeah, that, it's the is Xbox 360. Xbox 360, not the 180. That's the uh, 180 version. But the Xbox, you can put on a uh, headset like this, mm -hmm. listen to other people. You, you don't even, you're not even familiar with who these people are. Mm. Engage in dialogue, and you can play them, compete against them in this virtual world as you do whatever it is that you're doing in this game. Mm. Now, my oldest boy, Noah, he turned 13 on, uh, back in June. He came to me and he said, hey, Dad. <laughs> I would really like to have an Xbox. 
And I said, son, you really can have an Xbox if you pay for it all yourself, every single penny. Mm. So you know what he did? He paid for every it. single penny he did. And I go, all right, well, let, obviously, let's lay down some rules. Where did you get rules. the money? A birthday, um, you know, oh, okay. given uh, easy a pedicure. You know, I mean, the money, <laughs> it, it, it gathers up when you do certain things, oh, right? You get big money for that one. Big money. Well, it's untouchable claws. So I said, all right, Sonny, here's the thing. You know, obviously there's different ratings <coughs> of games, as Brad just mentioned. Okay. There's M for mature, there's T for teens, and there's E for everyone, E10, 10 years and younger. And I said, son, you're not going to be playing any teen games mm. for the most part, unless something comes out that is good. <laughs> what is out there, son, that you can play? Yeah. And he says, well, there's uh, this thing called Minecraft, there's uh, racing games that you can do, and that's all he does is he does these games where he rides around in circles and he competes against his brothers and sisters. But not all games are like that. In yeah. fact, it came, his console came with two games that he's not allowed to play. It's a Batman game. Nothing against Batman, but the video game is terrible. Yeah. You know, breaking heads and necks and eyeballs and everything else. Yeah. It's just absolutely gross. Well, I looked up from um, our buddy Carl Kirby. His son, Carl Kirby Jr., is a gaming enthusiast. Mm. And he put together a whole list of things here, and I'm going to read just a couple of these. If you're concerned about gaming and if you're not familiar with the whole gaming community, uh, we, we need to keep in mind some of these things that he writes here. He says, you need to train your child on how to play online games responsibly. Point out to them the dangers and what they should watch for. Engage with your kids while they play games. So you can see exactly what they're playing, what right. they're thinking. And then he says, stop watching the game turn over and watch your child's affection towards the game. Wow. And if you notice that his affection towards the game is different than his affection towards you mm. or towards the Lord, it's time to intervene. Right. And a lot of parents use gaming as an opportunity to babysit yeah. their children. Give me my alone time. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And they leave their kids to the demise of the gaming world. We need to be careful with that. Right. Uh, we need to be aware of how our children use the <coughs> Internet. And he says, make no mistake about it, when you're hooked up to the gaming world, you're hooked up to the Internet. Mm -hmm. You can surf the Internet in certain of these consoles at the same exact time. So set limits, set boundaries, teach your children to keep their personal information a secret, and children must watch their own conduct online. So uh, if you want more information on that, Carl Kirby Jr., he's an amazing uh, gamist, but he's written quite a bit concerning the topic. How old is he? Uh, well, he's probably uh, older 20s. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know Carl was up there. His, his son. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So rforh.com, reasonforhope.com is really what it is. So rforh.com. If you need more information uh, concerning gaming, your child is involved in that, or you just want more information yourself. Do you know a good balance to, uh, to games would be reading? Don't let your kids get into things that are going to be intense all the time because they won't right. know how to relax. Right. And, and it's very important. Uh, I remember in my surfing days, when there was no surf, I had friends that were so psyched up, they would jump off cliffs. And one guy jumped off a 50-foot 50, 50 cliff to see how deep the water was, and he came up with his nose bleeding because he hit the bottom. But he was first, and I thought, I'm never going to do that. But that's what happens when you're, when you're always psyched up and you can't relax. So reading a book is a good way to just teach a kid patience. Well, here, here's the thing. This is what's so amazing what you just said, because we went and did some cliff jumping this past week. In yeah, well, Lake I just felt <clears throat> such a stupid thing to do that I thought only fools would do that, so I just felt my spirit to share. You know, okay, so I, went, I was at Lake Havasu this past week on a family vacation with a couple of their families. Jumping off cliffs? And I refused to jump off <coughs> the cliffs myself, but I allowed my kids to do so. But hang on a minute. Didn't you jump off a cliff many years ago, a big one? You know, I, I did. It was a rather large cliff over at a place called Copper Canyon where a lot of partying goes on. I, I didn't party at no, the time, and I don't party not. since, obviously. Uh, but I was there, and this uh, television crew shows up called Extra. They have a, there's a primetime show today. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, would any of you mind jumping off this cliff? And I said, jumping off a cliff? I remember my mom saying one time, if Jimmy <laughs> jumps off a cliff and tells you to jump off a cliff, will you be willing to do it? So how high was this, Mark? You know, I don't, even, I don't even know how high it was. All I know is when I got to the, almost to the top, about 10 feet away from the top, I looked over and my knees began to shake. That's, that's common sense. And I climbed the rest of that and I jumped. And when they actually showed it on television, uh, they showed all these people jumping off cliffs. And then the announcer comes up and he says, but the real partiers, 
<laughs> they jumped from here. And then it showed me jump and just going, ah! <laughs> and, I, and I didn't get hurt. You grew a beard, right? I did. Going down. <laughs> but, but it, you know, it did hurt, but I didn't get hurt. There's a, there's a very big difference. So you let your kids jump on in, in the weekend? On the smaller cliffs. And I said, sons, you see what those little white crosses mean on these cliffs? And there were. There's little white crosses that are were on these. Were they buried people? It's where people died, jumping. Seriously? Yeah, there are rocks, you know, the, the water's down and stuff like that. So my kids didn't jump, jump above 20 feet. Yeah. 20 feet was 20 about 20 feet's the, enough. The limit. <coughs> yeah. You've probably been on 20-foot waves, Ray. Uh -huh. <laughs> Surfing. Use, use a little surfing kind. We can okay. outreach to brief. All right. So I am in Lake Havasu trying to witness to other skiers. <laughs> well, you actually went out on Saturday, mm -hmm. and you did some open-air preaching, but not in Huntington. Yeah, I went to another place, uh, Newport Beach, which is a beautiful place. We've got a right. little clip here. I think it explains everything. So let's go to the clip if we've got it. Yeah, Newport Beach. Well, Huntington Beach had a Christian music group playing. They, they come each year and they tend to drown out the gospel when you're talking to people. So I've come down to Newport Beach. Scotty's away on assignment in Washington, D.C. And so this is beautiful Newport Beach. And Eddie's come out here to help me. And, and uh, Jeff Sido, who uh, co-authored, there he is, aerospace engineer, rocket scientist, who co-authored uh, Made in Heaven with me. Uh, he is here today to support us. He brought me here today. And Eddie is up there talking to the crowd. And it's a good crowd. We've had a great time. I've been preaching for about 40 minutes. The crowd's been very responsive. And Eddie's doing really well. All right, here's one for you sports guys. Who can He's got the whole world in his hands. I'm not going to sing that to you, but... So Eddie's still going. And uh, he's got to get a little crowd going there. It's really good to have the crowd uh, hooting and hollering. So that's Eddie, our uh, producer of our television program, and he's up there open air preaching. And I'm so proud of our guys when they put their money where their mouth is, or their mouth where their convictions are, should I say. What is the Marine term? What does Semper Fi mean? What does that mean? Always faithful. Always faithful is correct. Come here. He's got the whole world no, not again. Oh. I'm not going to sing that. That's good. <laughs> We're going to see the world again. You know, Eddie did so well. Uh, I stood and filmed for a while, but the guy that got on the box was, <clears throat> I don't know if he was totally there. He was a, a, a vet, and uh, he, uh, I think he could have been slightly drunk, but his daughter was very drunk, and she mm. just took over. Uh, Proverbs warns about women like this. Sure mm. does. And uh, Eddie handled it so well. He was very sensitive to him and her. I would have told her to go away, I think. Oh, you would have? I think so. What so a loud, obnoxious heckler, which is what we look for, you actually would have sent her away. She, she was wasn't that bad. a heckler. She was just nasty. I was going to ask someone in the crowd to take her for lunch. I'd pay. And she was that <laughs> bad. She just kept jumping in. Every time her father would go to say something, she would jump in and answer for him. And uh, it was just not good. But Eddie any, any, any handled it really well. Hmm. Well, I missed Friday night, but Brad went out on Friday night, went to uh, the outlets at Orange. Brad, what was your encounter? Any? Uh, yeah, any uh, our team went out to the block at Orange. Uh, hmm. I guess they changed the name. I, I still don't use it yet. But, uh, yeah, our team got together, and we split off. And, uh, and I ended up uh, going off with uh, Ken Kish from our group. And, and one of the things I, I struggle with sometimes is just getting started, find that one person to, to start talking to. And so I challenged Ken. I said, Ken, you know, I'm not very good at uh, just finding that person. I want you to pick them for me. Oh. And, and which I found to be very helpful because I'm a lot better at doing what I'm told than I am initiating my <laughs> own courage. And so he picked uh, a couple out, no take. But the next person he took uh, a, a track and and we were able to get into a conversation. It was a good half hour conversation. Uh, he was a Muslim man. His name was Laith. And uh, the conversation went really well and uh, ended up taking a uh, white Christianity track. Um, and the gospel really seemed to ring true to him. Uh, I think he was really starting to uh, connect with what we were saying. So I, I, we're, pr we're still praying for him because the, 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 an encounter like that just kind of sticks with you. So that is a regular fishing hole that we have. And, Ray, you recommend people getting a regular fishing hole. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got to discipline yourself to go there. And as I've mentioned before, don't go there at, say, 8 o'clock on a Friday night and come home at 3 a.m. because the next week will seem like a burden to you. Mm. Go at 8 o'clock, come back at 10, have a pizza, enjoy yourself, and then next week it won't seem such a burden. That means you can keep doing it for years uh, and years. Um, so, Mark, I don't know if I'd let you pick the person I'm going to witness to. You'd look around for the biggest, nastiest 
dude I'll with see. a mohawk. <laughs> or I would say, see that nice young lady there with the stroller and the screaming baby? That was my rule. I Yes. No strollers. No strollers. Yeah, babies. I, I had to set a few ground rules. Yeah, nice it, it, it is difficult, boy, and that would be a lot of fun to try to pick for somebody else. But I'd hate for them to pick somebody for me because they would pick uh, my white cravat yes. individual. Even a dog, someone with a dog, sometimes difficult because the dog starts going crazy when you get to the cross. A little demon possessed mm. dog. Well, you know, speaking of street window scene, we got this email from Jennifer. She said, "While I believe that every Christian ought to share their faith at least with friends, family, and coworkers, and be prepared to give a defense at any time, I don't know." that I believe that every Christian must go out street witnessing. Some people really aren't made for talking to absolute strangers. On the other hand, social awkwardness should not be given as an excuse for not witnessing. Should I try to convince my self-proclaimed socially awkward friends to go witnessing, and if so, how? Now, before you answer that, I want to read a very uh, convicting quote here. And this is what's so neat. When you quote other people, you don't get in trouble. Right. Because you're not the one who said it. And I taught this past Sunday at my church. You're not going to quote me, are you? And Ray Comfort once said, <laughs> no, I'm not, actually. But uh, how about, I'll start off with C.H. Uh, Spurgeon. He right. said, in answering a student's question, which was, will the heathen who have not heard the gospel be saved? He replied and said, it is more a question with me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not can be saved. Wow. Whew. Very, very convicting. And let me jump right into Tozer while we're being convicted. Uh, two, two men who were greatly used by God, both Tozer and Spurgeon, he said, the fall of man has created a perpetual crisis. It will last until sin has been put down and Christ reigns over a redeemed and restored world. Until that time, the earth remains a disaster area and its inhabitants live in a state of extraordinary emergency. To me, it has always been difficult to understand those evangelical Christians who insist upon living in the crisis as if no crisis existed. They say they serve the Lord, but they divide their days so as to leave plenty of time to play and loaf and enjoy the pleasures of the world as well. They are at ease while the world burns. Wow, good old Tozer. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's the issue. I mean, uh, Jennifer, you said that you, you believe that a Christian should share uh, their faith with at least friends, family, and co-workers. Well, why do you stop there? Right. You know, if, uh, you, why do you share it with friends, family, and co Because you care about them. Well, I'll let you care for people extend beyond those borders. Another word for evangelism is love. Wow. So the depth of your evangelism is equal to the depth of your love. If you love people, you can't stop at friends, family, and co-workers. You've got to go to strangers. And that's the motivation for reaching out to the lost. Um, you said, I don't know that, uh, or believe that every Christian must go out street. What is it? Well, Jesus said to go. Yeah. So if you don't want to go street, when I saying avoid streets, but go somewhere. <laughs> You know, everyone is on the verge of passing on into eternity, yeah. and they're standing on the precipice of death, whether they're young or whether they're old, whether they're sharp intellectually or whether they're like mm -hmm. easy. Sorry, easy's not here, so we can lame on him a little bit. But here's oui. the thing. Well, I just take it from Brad. Oh, okay. He's passing me these notes, and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> so er everybody's there. So where do you draw the line? You, you nailed it. Yeah. Jesus drew the line where? <laughs> go to the whole world. In, in the sand. He said, go into all, oh, go into right. all the world and <laughs> preach the gospel to every creature, every person. Yeah. So when you're in line at the store, you're handing out a track. You're thinking of a way to be creative and reaching out to the lost. You may not be able to engage in a conversation, but there's something that you can do. Yeah. So you need to do what you've been called to do. And sometimes I come across people say, hey, I, I don't know what God's calling is in my life concerning the subject. I would say, well, do what you know you're supposed to do, and you're going to know what you're supposed to do. And what is that? We know that we are supposed to open up our mouths yeah. as we ought and preach the gospel to people. Brad, what are your thoughts? Well, if uh, social awkwardness was the line, I'd never cross it or, or be on this show. <laughs> but, that's uh, true. Yeah, that's me. Uh, which I guess it brings us to the tool of the day. Uh, here's a book uh, that I have been able to put down. Uh, they use too much glue in the binding. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but uh, I haven't read it yet, but uh, I have skimmed through it. And uh, Who designed it, the cover? Uh, an amazing artist uh, who will go un unnamed. 
And um, it was Brad. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know where to go from there, did you? <laughs> no. uh, but it basically, it, uh, atheists always have that question. They try to, you know, dismantle the Christian faith by, and uh, this has over 200 questions with answer, quick answers for those, hmm. and uh, which brings us to one of our next questions. Take yeah. Away. What are you looking over here for? You're miles away in another studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is the question. It comes comes from Carlos. He says, "I watch your show regularly." I'm a little hung up on the literal translation of Genesis chapter 3, specifically the talking snake, for the following reasons. And I'll say a couple of them. Uh, Snakes don't have lips, Ray, which (laughs) seems pretty necessary for properly enunciating words. How about the tongue and the teeth of snakes are also inadequately formed for creating vowels and consonants. More importantly, snakes do not possess vocal cords, which only exist in mammals. Lastly, snakes lack a cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that coordinates the lips, tongue, teeth, and vocal cords to produce speech. Should I interpret Genesis 3 as mythology? If not, how do I get around the talking snake issue? Brad, I'm going to throw I've that got, right I've back. Got, I've got to say this. Before I give that to you, Brad, <clears throat> I'm give that. Uh, scientists just sound fossils proving that snakes had lips. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, we laugh at that, but yeah. listen, this is the evidence that is presented within the scholastic world right. when it comes to evolution. Stay tuned for evolution versus God. It, we're going to discuss Absolutely. a little bit about that. But hey, let's jump over to you, uh, Brad. What, what do you say? Well, Talking snakes. this tool might give us an answer. Let's see. <laughs> Question 202, do you really believe in talking snakes and talking donkeys? The quick answer is, would you consider yourself to be a talking primate? And they certainly do. If you totally believe evolution, you've got to say you're a talking primate. Yeah. And, you know, there's such a thing as talking birds. They're called parrots. You've got mm. flying fish. But the thing is, when you're a Christian, it opens up the whole world to the supernatural. Right. Anything can happen. Uh, uh, snakes can talk. Donkeys can talk. Jesus can walk on water. He can multiply right. fish. He can open up the Red Sea because we're believing in the supernatural. So when you're a non-Christian, you've got to reason everything. When you're a Christian, you just trust that what God's Word says is Yeah, the bottom line is if God is who he says he is, and he is who he says he is, then everything he does is miraculous. Everything he does is wondrous, and he can manipulate the laws of nature, not the laws of morality, but the laws of nature to do what he tells them to do. Mm -hmm. And that's not hard for God. Nothing is too difficult for our God, and that is the God we serve. He alone is awesome. He is wonderful. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in for this edition of On the Box as we deal with gaming and things of the like. We hope you, you come back tomorrow. You quote the Ten Commandments because you've got <laughs> eight seconds to go. <laughs> we hope you come back tomorrow. I think Easy's going to be with us tomorrow. Oh, that's great. We look forward to seeing him again. God bless you guys. See you tomorrow. Please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's on the box at livingwaters.com. On the box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll free 1 800 437 1893. Now go and preach the gospel.